Thank you so much for joining us. I am Brian Amkraut, the Executive Director of the Laura and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. Um, we are pleased to welcome you here today uh, for the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation Lecture in Bioethics. Uh, please bear with me uh, for a couple of announcements before we get on with our introduction uh, and our talk for today. Uh, first, for those of you who don't know, the Lifelong Learning Program is a non-degree, non-credit division of Case Western Reserve University engaged primarily in community outreach and public programming. Uh, before I introduce Paul, I want to give a special thank you to the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation for sponsoring uh, this program. It enabled us to bring Paul in not just for today, he's been here since Friday, uh, spent uh, yesterday morning at Park Synagogue, which I heard uh, was not only quite well attended, but very well received. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll be at the Cleveland Clinic uh, for Grand Rounds, and we thank the Cleveland Clinic as well for being our partner in bringing Dr. Wolpe to Cleveland. So a few words about Paul Wolpe. He is the Aza Griggs Candler Professor of Bioethics, the Raymond Shinazi Distinguished Research Professor of Jewish Bioethics, Professor of Medicine, Pediatrics, Psychiatry, and Sociology, and the Director of the Center for Ethics, all at Emory University. He's also the senior bioethicist at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. You know that much better as NASA. Uh, he is the co-editor of the American Journal of Bioethics, which is the premier scholarly journal in bioethics, and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Bioethics Neuroscience. Sits on the editorial boards of over a dozen professional journals. He is a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, a fellow of the Hastings Center, fellow of the College of of Philadelphia, which is the country's oldest medical society. His work focuses on the social, religious, and ideological impact of biotechnology on the human condition. He sits on many national and international nonprofit organizational boards and consults for academic institutions and biomedical industry. Dr. Wolpe won the 2011 World Technology Network Award in Ethics. He has recorded a TED Talk. He was named one of Trust Across America's Top 100 Thought Leaders in Trustworthy Business Behavior and was profiled in November 2011 Atlantic Magazine as a, quote, brave thinker of 2011. He was also chosen by the teaching company as a superstar teacher of America. Dr. Wolpe is a frequent contributor and commentator in both the broadcast and print media, recently featured on 60 Minutes and with a personal profile in the Science Times of the New York Times. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Root Wolpe. Well, thanks very much. It's, uh Great pleasure to be here for me, and I've really enjoyed my, my weekend here, and um, uh, it's been a delight, and I hope I have an opportunity to come back soon. I've made some new friends and got to see some old friends. I can't think of a better topic for us to talk about right before the Super Bowl than death. <laughs> um, but uh, that's what we're talking about today is death. And um, it's going to be a, a bit of a quirky talk. I'm going to go through a uh, series of different kinds of um, ideas about the nature of death. It's not just going to be about ending life. It's going to be about the nature of death in general. But what I want to do is speak relatively briefly and then have lots of time for us to, uh, to have conversation. So, human beings have always been fascinated by death. They've always been scared of it. It's uh, some th of all the things in human life that we have trouble conceptualizing. Death is probably at the top of the list. Even more than birth, even more than the fact that we're here at all. It just doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, if birth is something of a wonder, then death is something of a mystery. That we are here at some point and then somehow not here anymore seems to us to be almost bizarre. The ancients spent an inordinate amount of time on death. The oldest monuments, the oldest structures that we have on earth are in one way or another dedicated to death. That is one of the oldest standing structures on the planet and it is a death monument. Um, the pyramids, I mean, the great structures of ancient time that we still have are either astronomical, like Stonehenge, or dedicated to death. Those were the two. Uh, ways in which the ancients seemed to build things that lasted to the modern day. Modern religion, across the board, 
has been defined by some sociologists of religion and psychologists of religion as a death compensation system. That is, they have suggested that part of the reason that we have religion is to try to explain death to ourselves. The Hebrews developed their religious perspective in direct contrast with the Egyptian focus on death and became the first religion to not make death central to the way in which the Hebrews conceptualized the world. Um, and to this day, I mean, Judaism doesn't really have a sense of, a description of, nor does it pay much attention to the afterlife. It believes in one, it says there is one, but it suggests that speculating about it, is, speculating about it isn't something we should waste our time on. It's a very this-worldly oriented religion. So the idea of death is old, and our, our mystery, the mystery of death is old, but interpretations of death change over time. Lifespans change over time, which change the way in which we think about death. And towards the end of this talk, I'll tell you about a show I was on. I came to Cleveland from New York, not from Atlanta where I live. And I was in New York because I was on Intelligence Squared, a PBS show. You can pull it up and, and you can watch this, where I debated uh, Aubrey de Grey, the guru of radical life extension who wants to live to two or three hundred, um, about whether pursuing life extension for its own sake is an ethically worthy thing to do. <clears throat> we've changed the way in which we think about death and the way in which, we've the way in which we think about leading up to death. Right? I mean, the story we were told, my generation, the generation before me, one or two, I'm not 100% sure that my children's generation think this way, was you work for a certain time and then you are owed this period of relaxation we call retirement. And in fact, if you, man if, if you leave the planet before you get there, somehow you were gypped. You were, you, know, you were cheated out of your retirement. That's a pretty new way of thinking of the lifespan and death. That you work towards a time when you no longer work, and then you have this period before you die. I mean, for most of history, people worked until they died, or at least worked until they were no longer capable of working, and then usually died fairly shortly after that. And that itself may be changing, and what would happen if we did live to 150 or 200? Uh, one of the points I tried to make to Aubrey de Grey was I said, look, you know, you seem to think if you lived, to, if someone lived till 200, that they'd want to work for 150 years and then have 50 years retirement. I said, if you're a longshoreman, 30 or 40 years of doing that is plenty. And if you live to 200, you're not going to be a longshoreman for 150 years because you're living longer. Um, but I didn't make much of an impression on him because he wants to live to 200. Um, in the Middle Ages, <clears throat> people became very um, interested in the idea of life taking you as some as lifespans began to increase. And there were a whole series of wonderful woodcuts that I love of death coming and taking people from life. And if you look at uh, the lower right here, no, sorry, lower left, reversing it, um, it is a um, wise man, a philosopher, sitting under a tree, and death has pulled him in the middle of his contemplation. But in the upper right, it's a king. And the point of these woodcuts is to say, doesn't matter who you are, when death comes, you don't get much of a choice in the matter. And my favorite one is this one. Because I love the look on this guy's face. He's, he's negotiating. He said, no, 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 wait a second. I got to get this stuff to market, so you can't take me right now. And that finger of his, <coughs> excuse me, says more about how we think about death than I think almost anything else. And in Jewish history, we've had an ambivalence about the nature of death also. There have been times that death, death was seen Jewishly as a tragedy and other times when it wasn't. Um, you know, this is the uh, picture on the left here is not a Jewish picture, but the one, and the one on the right is a Christian picture, but they show different ways in which death is, death is conceived. Death can be conceived as this horrible skeleton, you know, with a scythe coming to wrench you, almost like the woodcuts. 
But death is also sometimes conceived of as relief. In a world with a lot of suffering and pain, um, when death comes and takes you, it sometimes can be seen as very merciful. And certainly, Jewish works have been written that take that perspective. <coughs> Excuse me. This one called Beautiful Death. So I'm going to just grab a little water here. This one called Beautiful Death. Um, and uh, the Kiss of God, which was, you know, the idea of leaving this world with a divine kiss or an angelic kiss goes across a number of different religions. And I want us to keep this in mind because the way in which we think about death today, yes, there are points in which in someone suffering might, we might think of death as a release or something desirable, but really we have a very oppositional attitude towards death. Death is something we want to put off. Death is something we want to avoid. Death is not integrated into the nature of life the way it was. Over 75%, about 80% of people say they want to die at home, and about 85% of people die in hospitals. Right? So we have this conflict all the time about how we're going to die and, and, and the conditions of our death that I think characterizes modern times. So let's first start with our problem of defining death. A lot of people think that defining death is only about defining that moment when we die, but I want to try to argue that death is much more expansive than that, and our thoughts about death are much more expansive than that. One of my favorite books called The Forest People by Colin Turnbull, in it, one of the pygmies, it's about the uh, <coughs> Bambuti or the pygmies of the Ituri forest in the Congo. And one of them explains to him how the pygmies see death. The pygmies express various degrees of illness. This is Turnbull's expression, illness, by saying that someone is hot, with fever, ill, dead, completely or absolutely dead, and finally dead forever. So there's more than one way of being dead amongst the Bambuti, and I want to argue there's more than one way of being dead in our society too, it's just that we don't think of it that way. So all of this started in one sense with the advent of brain death. Brain death is a made-up concept. Throughout all of human history and almost every society without exception, you were dead when your heart stopped beating and your lungs stopped working. That's the Talmudic definition of death, that's the Christian, that's the Islamic, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's in Buddhism, it's in um, uh, Hinduism, it's in Taoism. That's when you die for all of human history without much exception until the 1970s. Think about that for a second. And then in one moment, so to speak, historically, we changed the definition of death. I don't think we appreciate the implications of that statement. We changed human history by saying <clears throat> the time when everybody thinks you die is not exactly when you die. We're going to come up with another definition that is much more complicated that the average human being cannot use. You cannot walk up to a body and tell if it is brain dead. You can come up to a body and tell if its heart has stopped beating with just the, a minimal of, tra minimal of training. But you have to use mechanisms and expertise and tests and actually two pieces of expertise, two people, in order to determine if a person is brain dead. And in fact, brain death was not defined to make de defining death easier or to solve a problem of death itself. Brain death was defined originally very explicitly in the Harvard criteria, it happened at Harvard, for one reason, to allow organ transplantation. The problem with cardiac and respiratory death is that once the heart and the lungs stop, the organs that you want are damaged because they don't have enough oxygen. <clears throat> so if you want to do transplant, cadaveric transplant, you got to keep the heart going. But if you keep the heart going, then you can't use a heart criterion for death. 
and a person has to be declared dead before we can um, use their organs. So, finally in 1981, it all got put together under the Uniform Determination of Death Act, um, created a framework for our entire country, but there's a problem. And the problem is that to the average person, a body that is warm to the touch, whose heart is beating, whose lungs are respiring, just doesn't seem dead. And so we have this constant struggle that I'll talk about in a minute between the medical criteria of death and the lay criteria of death. And in fact, brain death is a legal um, category. And it is about a medical consensus that became part of law in the United States, not something that was sort of in the public mind. It wasn't that there were people out there who thought at some point, non-physicians, who thought, you know, <clears throat> there's something wrong with our definition of death. It isn't really getting at it. We need something new. No, no, no. This was entirely conceived of within the medical pro profession to solve a medical problem, which was how do we get organs out of cadavers and put them in healthy people and not healthy people to make them help. It's a strange thing to think that someone can be dead in our culture in a situation where virtually all of the body, bodily organs are working, except the brain. And even there, there's a little bit of wiggle room, so to speak. It's supposed to be complete cessation of brain activity, but when you talk to neurologists, you see that in fact it isn't. There's brain activity that sometimes lingers, there's random firings of the brain. So they don't wait till all brain activity has ceased. So already you're beginning to um, push on the boundaries of this definition and that has caused some issues as well. So, it used to be simple. In my day, people died. <laughs> it's not nearly as simple anymore. And there's another problem. People who are brain dead show a lot of other kinds of signs of life. Homeostasis, their bodies um, maintain temperature and maintain balances of, uh, of, of chemicals that keep us alive. They eliminate, they um, eliminate food that goes through their body. The energy system of their body is maintained. If you cut them, their wound heals. Their body, their immune system will fight off an infection. They have a variety of different kinds of responses that their body responds to. Um, and, and other things, we don't need to know all of them. One that you do need to know is that brain-dead female bodies have gestated fetuses. The idea that a dead body could gestate and give birth to a live organism just seems to be a tough one for us to conceptualize. If what is critical about human life, if the way in which we conceptualize human beings is some kind of integration, after all, we define death as sort of the disintegration of the body. A brain-dead person is pretty well integrated. So not only did we have to change the physiological criteria, we had to start changing how we actually thought about death itself. If then we end up with someone like Jahi McMath. Jahi was a 13-year-old uh, girl who went in for a routine tonsillectomy in 2013. And um, something went wrong. She was declared brain dead. But her family refused to accept that definition. And now, this is, uh, there's an ongoing, it's a very complicated case with lots of ins and outs. The court declared her dead, declared, did, um, did, said that the hospital had every right to remove life support systems, the family sued, the uh, uh, family finally got the hospital in Oakland, California to release her body and then they brought her to a place where um, they had agreed to keep her alive and do a series of procedures on her to try to keep her, keep her fed and to keep her um, oxygenated. 
they claim, they see her moving, they see her responding, and that is something that people do. There are a series of reflexes that still exist in people who are in this condition. And families, I mean, think about this. You have a body that's warm, its heart is beating, lungs are working, engages in movement, and one of the fascinating psychological phenomena here is the same movement that the healthcare team sees as random, the family sees as intentional or responsive. And this happens over and over again. It happened with Terry Schiavo, who I'll talk about in a second. <coughs> we impute onto this body whatever our preconception is about its condition. And while the doctors insist that this is a common um, behavior set for people who are brain dead, the family insists that this is their daughter who they recognize. The attorney, Christopher Dolan, when this all uh, started to come down, created, got an MRI of Jahi's brain um, in, in 2004, October of 2004, um, presented it to uh, the media to try to show that her brain looked very integrated. This is 10 months after a coroner signed her death certificate. Um, his argument is that there's brain activity and he wants the death reversed. The death reversed. Now, that's a very strange thing when you think about it. Because we think she is either dead or not dead. We only really have two categories. But actually, Jahi right now seems to be in some kind of a limbo where she is neither dead nor not dead. We have created a new category of existence that seems to be in neither of those camps particularly. Now the doctors will insist she's dead, and the family will insist she's not dead. But again, there's something counterintuitive to the average person about someone who now is over two years she has been in this condition. They started a Facebook page, um, to try to uh, argue for his life and the Facebook page um, is titled Keep Jahi McMath on Life Support. In October of this past year um, she turned 15 and that would cause a flurry of um, media. Then in December he sued the hospital about the original surgery. Was it supposed to be a routine surgery, minor surgery? And then, just last month, um, they entered that suit to void the death certificate for the first time. Is Jahi on life support or death support? How do we conceptualize her and her condition? We have a hard time with that. Where they have a harder time with that is in Japan. Japan does not have traditionally a cerebral sense of personhood. That is, in the West, for the last 100 or 200 years, <coughs> if you ask people, where is the seat of memory and personality and all of that, we think of it as in our brains. Japan traditionally thought of it as thoracic, so the site of personhood was in the gut. That is why when you commit seppuku or harikari, you disembowel yourself. You don't cut your head off because you are supposed to um, do your penance or, or express your shame in the center of your personhood. Now, they stand behind that person with a sword, and after they've disemboweled themselves, they kill them by uh, chopping their head off because that causes instant death and, and suffering. But the act of seppuku is an act of disemboweling. And there's actually some neurological... Uh, reasons to think that that's a, a, an interesting way to think about the self. Aside from the brain, the largest nervous system we have is in the gut. And we don't really know what all of that means because we can't separate those two nervous systems to try to understand them. But because of this view in Japan, it has made cadaveric transplant very difficult there. The medical profession would like to have cadaveric transplant, but if you're in a society that you believe that maintenance of um, the thoracic organs means that the personality is still alive and who cares about the brain, 
it's pretty tough to convince that society that it's okay to pull the organs out of someone who seems to be, who is breathing and whose um, lungs are working. So that is a struggle they've been having culturally in Japan. We haven't had that same struggle here because it isn't deep in our culture to think of personhood there, but the fact that we're having as much struggle as we're having here, imagine how much more it is in a culture where that is central to senses of identity. So, let's think about these problems with death definitions. Here's one. What is death? Every definition of death discusses its irreversibility, even brain death criteria. It's not cessation of all brain activity. It is irreversible cessation of all brain activity. Well, here's a problem. And here, well, first, here's the example. Um, if you look at this article, which you probably can't see, it's an international perspective on the diagnosis of death. And what I want to show you is in the first two sentences, they use the word irreversible three times. So it's irreversible. So here's an interesting paradox to think about. I die. I decide I want to cryo-preserve my head, which Ted Williams has done and a few other people. So they chop my head off, they stick it in a uh, nitrogen, frozen nitrogen chamber, and there it sits for another 100 years, 150 years. And all of a sudden, we have the technology to take that head, unfreeze it, and revive it. Well, guess what? I was never dead. Because it wasn't irreversible. They reversed it. It wasn't that I died and they revived me. By the definitions of death, I was never dead. But while I'm frozen and we don't know whether or not they'll ever get to the point that they can reverse it, we don't know if I am dead or not. We right now don't know if Ted Williams is dead. His head's in a freezer, sitting there waiting to be revived. It's kind of like a Schrodinger's cat problem. If they revise it someday, he was never dead. If they don't revise it someday, he's dead right now. So what I'm trying to show you is that our simple ways in which we think about death are actually much more problematic than we usually um, think about it. And in fact, that same thing happens on a minor scale. In a sense, when we pull someone out of that frozen lake, you all know that people sometimes end up under in frozen water, um, and they can be there for relatively long periods of time, and if we carefully and slowly warm their bodies back up, we can revive them. During that period, they are neither dead nor not dead because we don't know yet if we can revise them. And so if irreversibility is an integral part of definitions of death, then that body is neither dead nor not dead. If we had to choose one, it is right now not dead. And then when we fail to reverse it, it was always dead. So, we define death by its irreversibility. Um, how long do we try before we decide that it's irreversible? If they're in a state of not being dead or not dead, what is our moral obligation to try to revive them until we decide that they actually were always dead? And it ends up being not something that you can do empirically. It ends up being the judgment of the physician that it's become futile to try to revive them which can be a completely different judgment call in two physicians. And so the question of whether they're dead or not becomes ambiguous. To one physician, this person's already dead. And to another physician, no, they're still alive. Or at least they're not dead. They may not be alive, but they're not dead. <clears throat> and, of course, if you take the Harvard criteria you know, seriously, 
When we examine that brain and there's still some random activity, they're technically not dead even by Harvard criteria, though they're often declared dead. And if you get a couple drinks in a neurologist, they'll admit it to you. Just make sure you don't do it the day before they have to operate. Um, now that we sort of made problematic the idea of death medically, and I tried to show you that it isn't quite as simple as we sometimes make it seem, let's talk a little bit about death as a legal, ethical, social puzzle. Um, when is a person dead? Well, there are lots of steps from the moment of being alive to the moment of being dead, even if we don't really include necessarily all of those ambiguities I was talking about. So, there's a decision that's made, often, at some point, that we are going to remove those things that keep a person in a state of whatever we call that state. Their heart beating, their lungs going, maybe they're brain dead, maybe they're not. We stop life support. Now here's the interesting thing. This is where the ambiguity of our language happens all the time. How do we have life support on a dead person? We talk about it that way, but it's ambiguous. And we bioethicists, I won't show you one, I have them in my files, but we bioethicists just love to show a slide with, of news headlines like brain dead person dies. Right? <laughs> Those things, they're all over the place. Um, and, um, of course, brain death is death. So to a bioethicist or to a physician, that headline actually translates as dead person dies. Um, but that's part of the ambiguity and problematic part of this language. We stop life supports, we declare death, we stop death supports. Um, and now we have this person like Jahi McMath or like Terry Schiavo, and now they're in this ambiguous state, sometimes for a very long time. Maybe we procure organs, but you know, now we start a mourning process. And in my view, that's part of this death piece. I mean, we like to say, well, that person is now dead, but this is, it's very analogous to me to the question of illness. So I'm a sociologist, I'm going to sound like one now. In the West, individuals get sick. But historically, individuals didn't get sick. We think they did. But in many, many cultures from many parts in history, families got sick. I may be the one who today we say got the flu. But in this cultural conceptualization of those societies, as soon as I got the flu, I couldn't work. My family support system has to kick in. Um, everything changes in that family until I get better, and sometimes much for the worse. And in that sociological conceptualization, I didn't just get sick, my entire family got sick. Because the nature of the family body had a change in a pathological way until it recovered. And sometimes the family can remain sick after the designated patient is, quote unquote, all better. And so there, there's even this powerful idea of um, illness not being uh, just the way we think of it in the West as designated one patient. The same thing's true of death. The death process is just one stage when we finally decide that that body is, quote unquote, dead. But there are a whole series of other things that happen, mourning, funereal processes, um, and then transferring legal items. All of that is part of the death process. And in Judaism, of course, it's very well integrated into that. It also, by the way, was much easier in a time that all of that happened much more rapidly. So, <laughs> Excuse me. At the turn of the 20th century, William Osler, who was one of the great physicians of all time, did a study of 100 um, successive admissions to the emergency room at Johns Hopkins. And he discovered that, this, this was in 1900, 1901, somewhere in there, and he discovered that virtually without exception, three or four weeks later, they were either dead or at home, functioning, maybe with some deficits. Now think about 100 admissions to the uh, ICU or the emergency room today. Three weeks later, 
I don't know what percentage of them would still be in the hospital. Some percentage of them might still be in the ICU. But all of them, I mean, some of them might be home. Some of them might be dead. But there's this enormous group of them that will be something else. Still in the hospital, still in sick. We have stretched out this process of death and dying. Jahi McMath has been something for three years. We just don't know what it is. And in a time when all of this is very constricted and very close together, it's a quick death process. The person dies, the family mourns. It all seems to happen in a compressed way, so you can think of it as an incident. But when these things take place over months, years, decades, it's no longer an incident. And we have to change the way we think about death, away from it being an event to it being a process, and not just in the sense of dying. I mean, you often hear people who study death or physicians talk about death as a process, and they mean the process from the time that particular body begins to die till it actually is at the end of that process. But I'm talking about something much bigger. It's a process in the social sense because we have stretched those pieces of it out so much. And just... Say, say that again? Potential second death behavior. What is that? Oh, so, um, Terry Shiva. Well, if you, if you'll allow me, let's hold that for one second and I'll show you exactly what I mean with the Terry Shiva case. I'm afraid there's very little I can do. <laughs> <clears throat> the one quick, uh, uh, Sideline, because I think it's very interesting, and I'll, I'll say something Jew about the Jewish situation here. So, there is another problem with death, and that is what happens when you don't have the body. A ship sinks, a man goes off to war, or in the old days, a trader goes off for three, four months to do trading in some exotic place and never comes back. Are they living some life in that new place, or were they killed along the way? This was a very, very common situation in the ancient world. And not that uncommon in the medieval world either. So people had to come up with ways to think about that. So, <clears throat> there's this example of Tom Gordy. Tom Gordy was Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter's uncle. And he was declared dead by the US after being taken as a prisoner of war by the Japanese. His wife remarried and then he showed up after the war, and um, tragically decided, like in uh, that Tom Hanks movie, that his uh, wife was married to another man. We had that problem here in this country with 9-11, where Jewish law had a problem. According to Jewish law, you can't declare a person dead, and therefore, at least in the Orthodox community, his wife, and it's usually a him we're talking about, can't remar remarry until you can declare him dead, but you can't declare him dead unless there is evidence of his death, and then there are halachic uh, discussions about what that evidence is, and they give a couple of examples, which became sort of the paradigm. If a man falls into a furnace, well, the problem is, throughout most of history, I mean, his body is burned up. There's nothing there to, to prove that He's there. But if he was observed falling into the furnace, that was, this is in the Talmud, that was considered enough. Um, if a man falls into a body of water that is bound, a lake or a pond or a well, and his body is never recovered, he can be declared dead. But if he falls into the ocean, he cannot. <laughs> because his body could have washed up somewhere else alive. And so, the, you know, the rabbis, they tease this to death with all kinds of examples. But it was not theoretical when the towers fell on 9-11. There are a lot of Jewish men in those towers and a number of Orthodox men in those towers. And yet, for some of them, no biological materials were ever recovered. And the Orthodox community had to decide whether those women became agunot, which are... Widow, which are women who cannot get married again. It comes from the word for chains. They're still chained. 
<clears throat> to their husband, but it can't be proven that their husbands are dead. And um, there are three ways that you can prove that someone's dead. One is physical evidence, like I mentioned, eyewitness testimony. So if I see you getting killed by the lion, and I can testify, yes, I saw it, the lion um, killed him, no chance of life, that's okay. And, um, but there is a third. And the third is definitive proof that the person was in a situation that made continued life impossible. Kind of like falling into the furnace. And so a bait team was organized in the United States, and uh, Michael Broyd, who is the... Uh, is a professor of law at Emory and was on the bait team at the time, wrote the decision. And it said it was really important to try to find DNA evidence of, in the wreckage if they could. Um, and that would be enough. But in the few cases where they had none, the bait team decided that <coughs> if any evidence at all could be shown that the husband was in the Twin Towers, it was enough. So in fact, those women were not um, agunot, and the men were declared dead. So I took that little um, side trip just to say, there again, you know, death isn't certain. Death is a matter of interpretation. It's a matter of law. It's a matter of evidence. Um, Somehow our rational minds say, well, the person's either dead or not dead, but that isn't how we live our lives. We live our lives in social, legal, religious communities where these things are not near, nearly as certain sometimes as we think they are. So let's get to the final piece here. The idea of actually ending a life rather than interpreting whether or not a life is, has ended. So here is an interpretation of the death of King Saul. It becomes a very important discussion point in the Talmud about the nature of suicide. So what happened with this battle with the uh, king and his forces against the Philistines at Mount Gilboa? Well first, and this is not unimportant to the rabbis, it says that when Saul saw the Philistines, his heart trembled. So they actually give us something about his psychological state even before the battle starts. He's scared. The battle is a rout. The Jews get slaughtered. All three of his sons get killed. And now we have Saul. And I'm going to read you an uh, English translation of the Hebrew. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded from the archers. Then saw, said Saul unto, unto his armor bearer, draw thy sword and thrust me through, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. Um, that sometimes is translated as, instead of abuse me, make sport with me, which gave the rabbis an excuse to say, well, Saul is doing this altruistically because if the people see the enemy making sport with the king, torturing him, making sport with his body, they will lose, um, you know, One excuse, one out for Saul was that he did this not because he wanted to kill himself, but because he did it for the people. Um, but it seems to basically say they're going to torture me and I don't want to be, if you want to take the literally, literal reading. But his armor bearer would not do it for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. <clears throat> the suicide of Saul becomes a really important question when you think about the nature of suicide, and some modern Jewish writers have seized upon the suicide of Saul to argue that, the, and, and by the way, in almost without exception, with, there are a few exceptions, the rabbis give Saul an out. They don't blame him for having committed suicide. Well, if that's the case, then um, why? What's the out? And f someone, for example, Baruch Brody, a very well-known bioethicist, has argued, look, he was suffering so greatly, had arrows in his body, his death was inevitable, so it wasn't that much of a sin for him to kill himself. But and if that's the case, how is that really different than someone at the end of life suffering greatly from disease? 
And is that a vehicle to talk about the acceptability of suicide in Judaism? So, <clears throat> moral slippery slope. Just like there are many forms of death, there are many forms of dying. I'm going to talk about a few. So the, at the top is a natural death. You die from what we call natural causes. The second is what I call passive suicide. I'd say a large number of people in this room, probably me included, are engaged in passive suicide. We eat too many fatty foods. We don't exercise enough. Some of, us, some of you probably smoke. Kurt Vonnegut once said, smoking is the only honorable way to commit suicide. <laughs> um, so that's a kind of passive suicide. We aren't doing everything in our power to maintain our lives, which, by the way, is against Jewish law, but that's a whole other conversation. Then there's active suicide, killing oneself. Also against Jewish law, you're not supposed to uh, bury someone who has committed suicide in the same part of the uh, cemetery or in the Jewish cemetery. They had this place right outside the gates of some Jewish cemetery. But that was seen as so cruel that in practice, for most people who committed suicide, um, the rabbis interpreted the very act of committing suicide as being the act of someone with a deranged mind. And because they had a deranged mind, they, uh, the act was not considered to be intentional, and therefore they could be buried in the Jewish cemetery. Now we begin to think of some nuances. Passive euthanasia with permission. And by that is just a way of saying, um, I decide, don't treat me for this. I'm dying. I get an infection, and I refuse treatment for that infection. It's a, not a passive act. I'm actively refusing it. But I hear passive, I mean not a direct intervention to kill me. It is the refusal of an intervention to maintain me. And that has its own Jewish perspective that we can talk about. Then there's physician-assisted suicide, <laughs> where the physician gives me the means to kill myself, like an organ. Uh, then there's euthanasia with permission. That's what happens in the Netherlands and places like that, where it's not suicide. The physician actually administers that uh, dose, but it's done through a system where it's with checks and balances, and it's done officially. And then surrogate euthanasia, and by that I mean um, the man who's, and there have been a few cases like this, and it's, all, it's been more often men than women, who's been married for 50 years, 60 years, the wife is dying painfully of cancer, and finally, he can't stand the suffering anymore. He knows his wife wouldn't want to live like this. She's no longer compass mentis. And he, in some ways, ends her life. And juries, by the way, have been extraordinarily um, generous when those cases come up. When you do euthanasia out of a complete sense of you know, love and commitment, um, even though it's just as illegal, uh, juries have tended to be much more lenient on those, um, historically, though not always. And then finally, anything else is called homicide. Anything else is called homicide. Some of these are homicide as well under certain circumstances. So let's look at this case now finally, as, and I'll uh, begin to wrap up. And then we can have lots of time to talk. And I'll also answer your question about uh, second death. So I was involved in the Terry Schiavo case. <clears throat> and. Um, it's a tragic story. Uh, she had cardiac arrest in 1990 because of a potassium imbalance, probably due to a diet she was on um, that was not a healthy, uh, to try to lose weight. It's not a healthy diet. She picked a really bad diet. She had some issues with eating disorders before that. For the first three years, her parents and her husband um, worked together with her and, and her body until finally they had a falling out when her husband um, and that falling out originally was about therapy, not about whether she should live or die. And then the accusation started. He started accusing them of wanting settlement money and all kinds of stuff. They attempted to remove him as guardian, which they tried to do repeatedly and unsuccessfully for the next 10 years of her life, existence. In 1998, so eight years after the incident, Michael, her husband, tried to remove the feeding tube for the first time. In 2000, two years later, the first court ruling that uh, 
Sh uh, Terry Shiva would not have wanted to live like that. They got some evidence, mostly from Michael, saying that he knew she wouldn't want to live like that, and he had heard her say that. Um, 2001, the ruling was upheld again on appeal, and then follows three years of unending court battles, um, <coughs> attempt by the Schindlers, Terry's parents, to remove every judge that ruled against them, that sat on the case, to remove Michael is guarding him. And for Michael to remove Terry's feeding tube, uh, Jeb Bush got involved, some of you may remember, which was not his greatest moment, um, however you think about that. I mean, whichever side you were on. Two th and, and then in October of 2003, Terry's law was passed that allowed the governor to issue a one-time stay in certain cases. This was a law that referred only and entirely to Terry Schiavo. It was a law for one person at one moment in history that could never be used again because of the way it was written. 2004, they declared Terry's law unconstitutional. They finally removed her feeding tube in 2005. And then in March of 2005, Terry died. She was already dead. She died Officially, she was declared dead. It depends how you think about death. Um, Terry Shiva was a lovely, quite wonderful people, the people who knew her. Um, thought about her very fondly. It was a media absurdity. If you Google cartoons about Terry Shiva, there are hundreds of political cartoons written about her on both sides of the issue. Um, on the uh, upper left is somebody, I mean this was during the time, somebody there with microphones and, and cameras and equipment and it says, I wish they would just all go away. Um, and then the media death watch is below that. I became involved because of this brain scan. <clears throat> the brain on the left is Terry Schiavo's brain. The brain on the right is a healthy brain. I was involved in the publication of this slide. And what, you, what it shows <coughs> from a neurological perspective, first of all, a brain is half, its normal, half the normal size of a brain. That whole area in the, in the inside there. So this whole area here should look filled in like that. It's just fluid. Um, and the coroner decided that nothing in her brain showed consistency with life. Um, it continued all of these um, media reports, all these cartoons. This says, this is her final death line, and it says, thank you, Michael. So that's the pro sort of Michael Schiavo on the Schindler side. Terry Schiavo's feeding tube removed by court order that, um, you know, people who are pro-life are being muzzled and Lady Liberty is being blinded. And now I will answer your question. What does second death refer to? It's in this cartoon. Terry Schiavo's body, 1963 to 2005. Terry Schiavo, 1963 to 1990. When did Terry Schiavo leave us? When did that entity called Terry really cease to be? You could say in 1990, and you could say in 2005. Even Michael, for whom Terry died in the, er the earlier time, after her body was declared dead in, in 2005, had to engage in a second kind of mourning. And that's what I mean by second death. People now, in some very meaningful way, die twice. Some people. All right, <clears throat> to make things even more complicated, now they've discovered that some people who we thought were in persistent vegetative states with no meaningful brain activity actually are in what we call minimal, minimally conscious states, which means there is some meaningful brain activity going on. Using fMRI, a way of looking at brain activity, they would say things like to this body that they think is completely unresponsive, Imagine yourself playing tennis 
and then they see activation in the motor cortex, the part of the brain that controls movement. When you imagine, you can be completely relaxed, and if you just close your eyes and imagine hitting a tennis ball, your motor cortex will activate. Not the same as if you actually move your arm. So now we have people who are in some other state of being. People who are in persistent vegetative state were candidates for the possibility of removing life support systems. Now what do we do? What do you do with a minimally conscious person? Where something seems to be going on, but it's not full consciousness or full communication. We don't understand these states at all. So I'm going to end with Brittany Maynard. Some of you may uh, remember her. <coughs> she decided um, last year, 2014, uh, to end her life. She had terminal brain cancer, um, uh, which uh, started out diagnosed as an astrocytoma, and then um, after she had partial resection of her brain, um, it returned as a glioblastoma. Glioblastomas are not generally survivable cancers. Um, and she got a prognosis of six months to live, and she moved to Oregon to take advantage of the death with dignity law. She was 29 years old, and she went public with this on Facebook and in the media. She, as you see, she was on the cover of People. And on November 1st, 2014, surrounded by her family. She took the drugs prescribed to her, and she uh, died. Now, this is not a case of someone of interpretation of death being problematic. It is a case of interpretation of life being problematic. She wanted control over the nature of her death, and that has become, of course, an equally controversial problem with our society splitting on it. Right? The Oregon Death with Dignity Law has become a very controversial law, has been a very controversial law. Two things to say about it before I you know, conclude and we can talk. The first is, one of the fascinating things about it is, it hasn't been used nearly as much as everybody who was against it predicted. It ends up being relatively rarely used, if you think about how many people die, even in the state of Oregon. But here's the other fascinating thing. A significant subpopulation of people who get the drugs from the doctor to kill themselves never use them. Because for some people the issue isn't wanting to die, it's wanting to be in control of their death, not wanting to suffer. Now people generally aren't as scared of death as they are of dying. Right? And um, the dying process in our society, I mean, we're doing much better than we used to, but there were, you know, having control over that process for some people is extremely important. Zeke Emanuel, who is um, now at the University of Pennsylvania, he had been at NIH, and the head of their bioethics there, he was one of the architects um, of Obamacare, one of the architects under um, uh, the Clinton uh, healthcare system. Why I hope to die at 75. He has argued that, and he's Rahm Emanuel's brother and Ari Emanuel's brother. He has argued that at 75 he is going to stop taking any drugs, and if he gets sick he's going to allow himself to die. It will be interesting to see when he turns 75 if he actually does that. <laughs> well, that happened with Peter Singer. Peter Singer is a very famous philosopher who has argued, uh, he first of all started the animal liberation movement, but he also argued for infanticide of damaged children, and he argued that older people should not um, be given resources, they should be allowed to die, kind of like Zeke Emanuel. And then his mother got sick, and he put her in a nursing home. And he was challenged with that. He says, well, that goes against your philosophy. You know what his answer was? She's my mother. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know how philosophically rigorous an answer that is, but... And this, all, this is all another kind of argument that was started a while ago by John Hardwig in the Hastings Center, which is a bioethics uh, report, in which he basically said the following. Think about this argument. So here I am towards the end of my life, and I'm getting sick and I'm getting infirm. And my family is living in various different cities. I don't have any of my children living in the city where I'm dying. <clears throat> 
we don't have great health insurance. So right now, um, my children are having to financially support me, and I'm really you know, taking money out of their children's college funds. They have to run to wherever I'm living, have to run to Cleveland over and over to visit me. I'm disrupting their work lives. I'm taking resources out of the society, but I'm not actually contributing anything productive to the society. John Hardwick said, under those circumstances, I, John Hardwick, would feel an obligation to die, and you should too. You should feel an obligation to die. Because for what are you living under those circumstances? So we have this other interesting conversation that comes up over and over again about our obligation to die. A very un-Jewish concept, right? Life in Judaism is, is itself its own value. But we live in an instrumental world and in an instrumental country where perhaps that's not going to be true anymore. So I'll leave you with these last thoughts. Um, and I'll tell you now about this uh, show I was on, and you can go and um, Google it. So there are a whole group of people working on, um, ending, on, on uh, life extension. There's uh, Longevity, Immortality Inc. Immortality, Inc. There's Juvenon, who probably was pretty upset when Rejuvenon was founded. <coughs> Immortality, Inc., by the way, was started, started by Robert Ettinger, who insisted he was going to live to 500. Um, unfortunately, he died last year, so so much for that. But Immortality, Inc. had the greatest corporate byline of any company in the world, and I don't know why they didn't win an award for this. Being born is not a crime, so why must it carry a death sentence? <laughs> All right, so here I am on Intelligence Squared arguing with Aubrey de Grey, who says that we should extend life. And I won't go into this too much other than to say, my argument was not, look, if we cure, he wants to cure aging as a disease and all of the diseases of aging, great. I'm no more for Alzheimer's than anyone else. But my argument for him was, with him was not that. My argument with him was, he has often said he wants to live to 200 or 300 years old. And I argue that life extension for its own sake is not an ethically worthy endeavor. And that, in fact, I have never heard a single plausible argument for why someone living to 200 or 300, and he, says, he, says, he has said that the person who will live to be 1,000 has already been born. That's how optimistic he is about it. But I have never heard a single argument about how that would benefit society. It's always a narcissistic fantasy of my desire to live for a very long time. But no one has ever articulated, and they didn't. You can watch the whole thing. I challenged them with that, and they humphed and hawed, but no one ever came up with a single plausible reason why that long life would create better society or would contribute to society. The only one they ever come up with is, well, then we'll have these really wise 300 years old who will have 300 years of experience. And I pointed out, Life expectancy has doubled over the last century. And the result has been the fetishization of youth. We live in a culture where youth is the... We, we haven't said, wow, we have all of these smart old people. Let's turn our culture around to, to, to glean the wisdom of these old... That hasn't happened, even though we have a lot more old people than we ever had before. So much for the idea that we're going to value the wisdom of the elderly. Okay, so I will end by saying that we have a lot of, um, well, I'm going to end with a case from the, uh, from the Talmud, but <laughs> we have a lot of uh, writing about this nature of how we die and when we'll die and the circumstances under which we die, um, and not just in the secular literature, but in the Jewish literature as well. There are a lot of books that try to talk about the modern nature of dying under Judaism. And so we come back to the dilemma of Saul. What is the nature of how we think about death and our voluntary death? And I'm going to give you one short and one little longer uh, Talmudic story. The shorter one is, because I think the other thing we do is we stereotype how Judaism has thought about this for a long time, and it's very complicated there too. 
An elderly woman went to Rabbi Yose ben Halafta and said that she was so old that life had no more meaning, that she had lost her desire to live and wanted to leave this world. The rabbi asked her, how did you manage to live such, to such a ripe old age? And she said, oh, I go to synagogue every morning. Absent yourself from the synagogue for three consecutive days, said Rabbi Halafta. The woman followed his advice, and on the third day, she died. Wow, that's a cool Talmudic story. <laughs> what did he just do? Well, he just removed the impediment to her dying. Can we translate that into a right that we might have to remove the impediment to our dying, whatever that impediment might be? Psychological, social, this is a psychological impediment. Physical. But even more important is this problematic story that's classic in the literature and that we use all the time. Um, those of us in the sort of, who talk about Jewish dying, I don't know what we'd do without this story. You've heard this story before, uh, pieces of it, but I'll read it very quickly. The Roman legions came upon Rav Hanina ben Turajon while he was sitting studying Torah, which he was not allowed to do. Gathering large groups in public with the Torah scroll in his lap, they brought him and wrapped him in the Torah scroll, surrounded him with bundles of cane, and set fire to them. And they brought woolen sponges and soaked them in water and put them around his heart so that he would not die quickly. So the f they put wet wool around his chest so that the flame wouldn't burn through to his heart and kill him to make his torture longer. <clears throat> His daughter said to him, Father, that I should see you in such a condition. In other words, I'm suffering here. So open your mouth and breathe the flames in. So hasten your own death and decrease your suffering. Said he to them, it is better that it be taken by him who gave it. Uh, one should not injure oneself. I won't open my mouth and breathe the flames in because only God can take life. And I would be committing suicide. Now, think about that for a second. He just said you shouldn't commit suicide. So how do you reconcile that with what happens next? Said a Roman centurion to him, Rabbi, if I raise the flames and remove the woolen spudges that are around your heart, will you guarantee me a place in the world to come? And Halafta says, yes. The centurion continued, swear it to me. He swore. Immediately, the centurion raised the flames, removed the woolen sponges around his heart, and, uh, uh, Tarajon, Hanan, uh, ben Tarajon died immediately, and the centurion then threw himself into the flames. A heavenly voice was heard, Rav Hanini ben Tarajon and the centurion are welcome to the life of the world to come. This is a great story. It's a great story. It is a typical Talmudic story where everything but the kitchen sink is thrown in, and the important part to us here, though, is the centurion basically said, can I engage in euthanasia? And Tarajon said, yes, just after he said he wouldn't commit suicide. What do you do with that story? And I could tell you, I mean, there have been a lot of people who tried to get out of it. Well, one person, for example, argued brilliantly, I think. He said, that centurion was going to be punished for killing one of the great rabbis of all time, he spent his life in internal damnation. And the only reason Trajan agreed to do that was because he was saving the life of the centurion. Nice out. Uh, not sure I buy it. Um, there are a number of stories like this that, that make problematic the idea of death and dying. So, I'm going to end there. I haven't answered a single question that I'm sure is on your mind. Because the purpose here was just to show you how complicated and complex these things are. So thanks for your attention, and let's have a few minutes to discuss uh, this issue and any questions or responses you have, I'd love to hear. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Yeah. First, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. You take a case like Shivo and brain death. Yeah. We need the respirator. Is removing the respirator removing an impediment to death, or is it homicide? So, that is a great question. And again, Jew, wait, Jewishly, are you asking Jewishly or? Okay. Jewishly. Okay, so I'll put on my yarmulke and answer the question. So, that's a great question. There, there is a problem with with 
um, the way in which Judaism has interpreted that too. So there is this idea of the goseis. The goseis is someone in imminent, uh, uh, imminently dying. And there are all these rules about what you can and cannot do around a goseis. You're not allowed to move the goseis. The goseis is analogized to a flickering candle about to go out. And the idea is if you move it, or move their body, or you do anything to disturb them, they will die and you will have killed them. However, the Talmud tells us if there is a woodman uh, chopping wood outside the window where the person is dying, um, and that noise is keeping them from dying, you can make the woodman stop. So, now we've got a precedent for removing an impediment, but not actively killing. So what's the problem? The problem is, how do you think of actually turning off a respirator or, or, or extubating somebody? And the rabbis basically decided you can't do that. So what they do, uh, you can't, the human agency can't do that. So what they do at hospitals in Israel is they put respirators on timers. 24-hour timers. If you reset the timer, you get another 24 hours. If you don't touch the timer, it clicks off automatically and no human agency has stopped the respirator. Right? So that's one of the way around this. But it gets, you know, so, the other great story, um, I've got a whole collection of these stories from the Talmud and each one is fascinating. But the other great story is the story of Yehuda Hanasi. And many of you know that story. So Yehuda Hanasi was one of the greatest rabbis of all time. He redacted the Talmud. I mean, it's because of him that we have the Talmud. You don't get any greater than Yehuda Hanasi. And he's dying. And he's not only dying, he's dying very painfully. He has cholera, which is considered, by the way, did you know that the Talmud has a hierarchy of diseases that people die in in terms of their prestige? The greatest people die of cholera. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> because he's Yehuda Hanasi, he's dying of cholera. And um, cholera is very painful. And what it actually says in the Talmud was, he's, he's wearing his tefillin. But he has to, because, it di because cholera is a gastrointestinal disease, he has to constantly go to the bathroom. So every time he goes to the bathroom, he takes his tefillin off, goes to the bathroom, goes back, puts his tefillin back on. It's causing him excruciating pain. However, and, and all around him are his disciples praying and praying that Yehuda Hanasi will not die. And they're praying so fervently that the angel of death cannot get through that prayer um, canopy to get the soul of Yehud HaNasi. His non-Jewish maid prays first, may the prayers of the disciples be successful and may the great master live. Then she realizes how much he's suffering and she changes her prayer. And she says, may the um, disciples be unsuccessful, and may he uh, die. And in order to facilitate that, she takes crockery, and she drops it. And when the crockery shatters, the disciples are startled, and in that second, the angel of death takes the soul of Yehuda Hanas. What do you think the rabbis thought about this non-Jewish maid killing the greatest rabbi in history? That's exactly right. She's praised without exception. Now, you might not think that makes a lot of sense, but she is praised without exception because in the views of the rabbi, these disciples are inappropriately keeping him alive through that prayer. But I, I tell you that because that's how complicated this issue is. And, what, what, and the reason I'm harping on this is because I think sometimes... We Jews think that Judaism has one thing to say about this, and it doesn't. It has a lot of things to say about this, and they're all contradictory. Yeah? Is there anything to learn from the analogy that um, Tybee has made and the centurion would not jerk his That's a great question. Is there anything to be made about the fact that the centurion wasn't Jewish and this maid wasn't Jewish? Um, maybe sometimes it takes, you know, a non-Jewish mind to cut through the um, um, taken for granted ideas. Um, or maybe it's just a narrative device to use a non-Jewish foil to do something that a Jew will be hard, much harder for a Jew to do. 
right? Because after all, if the Roman centurion were Jewish, that might be a much more problematic issue um, of killing Tarajon actively. I mean, he raised the flames. He didn't just remove an impediment. And, you know, so by having a non-Jew do that. But in the case of um, Hanasi, that's a really interesting question, why they made it a non-Jewish woman uh, who, who did this thing that the rabbis praise so much. Yes, back, Sharon? Back, back there. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It isn't my call. <laughs> Sharon has one. But go ahead. You first. Yeah. Is, has there ever been anything done or said about what happens to the person who dies but then really isn't dead? And what happens, I hate to say this even, but financially, you know, when they are declared back amongst the living, do they get all their benefits back? Do they, you know, all these... Uh, you know, it, first of all, if you're talking about someone like Tom Gordy, like Jimmy Carter's World War II uncle who came back after the war, I have absolutely no idea what they did for him. I mean, that's a very rare thing to have someone declared dead who then comes back after a period of time. It happens. But I don't know, and to tell you the truth, I don't even know, I've never heard, I'm not a Talmud scholar in, in, in you know, deep depth of the entire Talmud, so I've never heard whether the Talmud has something to say about that specific issue or not. It's a great question. What does Jewish law say about brain death as an interpretation of death? So here's the interesting thing about brains. I wrote a chapter of, so my, one of my areas of, of interest is neuroscience, and I edit the American Journal of Bioethics Neuroscience. And so I'm very interested in ethical issues around the brain. So when the first real reader on that came out a few years ago, um, they asked me to write a chapter, and I said, I'll write the chapter on religion and neuroscience. Because I wanted, you know, the best way to learn about something that you don't know enough about is to write a chapter on it, so then you have to go learn it. And nobody knew anything about it. So I really began to explore into it, and I discovered that there's nothing about it almost anywhere. Why? Because the ancient people had no idea what the brain did and what its function was. They didn't understand brains. Aristotle thought it was a cooling chamber for the body. Right? And here and there, people sort of got the general idea, but since they had absolutely no idea how it worked or what. Right? So you will see, I mean, the Talmud and Jewish literature talks about almost every organ of the body. There's almost nothing on brains. Right? It talks about the heart. It talks about the liver. It talks about the spleen. It talks about all kinds of things. Very little on brains, of anything. So what it talks about, rather, are those traits that we think of as sitting in the brain, whether they're cognitive traits or affective traits, whether it's kindness or thought or memory. There's all kinds of stuff on that. But it's not tied to the brain. So to try to begin to think about it, what Judaism thinks about the brain is really problematic. Now we get to brain death. How should Judaism think about that? Well. Brain death, I mean, sorry, death criteria was always cardiac and respiratory. And there's all kinds of talk about that. Uh, I have a talk I, called when a, well, I call when a house falls on you on Shabbos. It's the name of the talk. Why? Because <laughs> that is the place in the Talmud where the rabbis talk the most about how you define death. Why? Because if a house falls on you on Shabbos, because of pikuach nefesh, because of saving a life, we must dig you out. But if you're dead, we don't have to dig you out till after Shabbos. Because that's work, which we're not supposed to do, and you're only supposed to violate that to save a life. So the rabbis say, well, how do you know if he's dead? There's no other place where it really matters right this second. Right? If it takes an hour to die, we don't care. We're not going anywhere. We're nomads. Uh, you know, the sheep are fine until we figure out if you're dead. But now we have to figure out right now, right this second. Because if you're dead, we have to stop digging. If you're not dead, we have to dig like hell. So we have to figure it out. So the rabbis begin to argue, how do you tell at that moment whether the person's dead? And, there, and, 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 and in the typical Tom Yudic fashion, the question is how far, they assume that the person is almost standing up, how far down do you dig till you can say definitively? So one rabbi says you dig down to here and you put a feather in front of their nose. Another one says you dig down to here, you try to get them to talk. Another one says you dig down to here, you listen to their heart. And, and this is an argument that you know, the rabbis have. Um, but the definitive 
thing for the rabbis was always breath and heartbeat. Now we get to the point where, brain, where there's brain death. And so the appeal came to Jews, um, will you accept this? And not just sort of, you know, not just the Haredi, not just the most, but will modern Orthodox Jews accept this? They needed to find a way to accept this. <coughs> There's a place in the Talmud where they discuss whether you could assume someone was dead who had been decapitated, even if you couldn't get to their heart and lungs. And through brilliant deduction, the rabbis assumed that if your head was chopped off, you were dead. They were very wise men. So what modern orthodoxy did is, it did is it said brain death is akin to decapitation. Therefore, we can declare someone who's brain dead, dead. So, now, there are some people in some small Hasidic communities who don't accept that. And when the Lubavitcher Rebbe died, um, you may remember that they were not going to take him off life supports or um, declare him dead until his heart stopped beating. And they kept him on life support long after he was considered dead by the medical establishment. So there is still that tension there, but modern orthodoxy and a number of, of even more traditional groups have accepted brain death using the analogy of decapitation. Yeah? Have there been cases where a person who is unquestionably brain dead has then showed continuing signs of cognitive thought? Right. So the answer is no. There's, there's never been a case of someone who was definitively considered brain dead who then recovered or showed cognitive thought. Here's the problem. If that were to ever happen, well, there have been some people who were declared brain dead who showed signs that they shouldn't have shown. But in those cases, it was shown that the diagnosis was done poorly or wrongly or not up to the standard of, of care. The critics say, well, there you go. Right? You declare someone brain dead, and then if they do the things that you don't think a brain dead person should do, you don't say there's something wrong with brain death, you say, oops, he wasn't brain dead. Well, you know, they see that as a fudge. There is no case of someone who was definitively shown to have no brain activity, who ever got brain activity back. It's never happened. The problem is that sometimes, as I said before, neurologists make brain death criteria, not the good ones, not at Cleveland Clinic, but there are, you know, there are a lot of neurologists out there in, in the great Know, expanse of our country, who are not as skilled as others and will make brain death declarations when perhaps they shouldn't have and, and, and not do it up to standard of care and not do it the way it should be done. And that's horrible because all that does is undermine this whole thing by, you know, giving, um, giving uh, ammunition to those who want to undermine the whole idea of brain death. I read the description for this lecture, and it talked about the rabbis talking about uh, King Saul's using his knife or his spear to kill himself on, and right. that's described in this description as a suicide. Right. And I, I differ with that. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily view it as a suicide any more than I see when during after Hanukkah and the Roman period, the 300 Jews who went, on, went up to Masada and they killed each other, I don't see that as a suicide, and we don't in our tradition. We describe that as a sanctification of God. The Kiddush Hashem. Right. I think of physician-assisted death today mm -hmm. as not being suicidal either. Right. I see that as, again, a way to alleviate the pain, etc. Would you comment on this? So the, the title of this is not the suicide of Saul. Notice I did not use the word suicide because it is exactly his action that is problematic. And how you interpret his action is exactly what I wanted to try to make difficult. The problem is it's an interpretation, right? You interpret it as as the sanctification you know, of Kiddush Hashem, someone else considers it suicide. And that's my whole point here, is that these categories are not, these categories are suffused with interpretation. 
We think of death as something that happens biologically, and of course there's a biological component to it, right? You know, if, if there was a dead animal up on the stage and a living animal up on the stage, we all see a very big biological difference. But because it's biologically based, we think it's got sort of a, it's like an on-off switch, and it's got a definitive nature to it, but we are meaning-making creatures. We, you know, everything that we do, we suffuse with um, both psychological and social and spiritual meaning, and that's why these categories are difficult to, to it's difficult to pigeonhole. Um, and so your interpretation of it is just as valid as someone else's. Uh, in our tradition, we tend to defer to rabbis for those interpretation, and the rabbis themselves don't agree. So your, you know, your interpretation is, is, is very valid. And by the way, rabbis have agreed with you about Saul. There are some rabbis who condemn Saul, and there are some rabbis who let Saul completely off and say what he did was perfectly appropriate, either because he stopped the Philistines from making sport with him, or because he was suffering, or because as a suffering, you know, as a suffering leader, he was better off dead than having his people watch him die, whether or not the Philistines made sport of him. So there's a lot of interpretations about the death of Saul. We're going to take one more. One more. If we could move away for a moment from the Bible yeah. and talk about modern day America and hospitals and nursing homes, mm -hmm. I haven't heard a single word about the factor of quality of life. Mm -hmm. Today, Mr. X is so depressed and so sick he won't eat, he won't bathe, he won't stand, he won't get visitors. Yeah. Just let me die. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow morning, he knows that family is coming from New York mm -hmm. and celebrating his birthday or someone's anniversary, bringing him a photo album he asked for for months. Yeah. He doesn't want to die. What about quality of life? Well, quality of life is, is part of how people determine whether they... Um, okay, let me start by saying quality of life is problematic as an idea because who determines quality of life? So um, we have measures of quality of life, we have quality of life scales and things like that, but the Talmud says the heart knows its own bitterness. And that's the Talmud. No one can tell you whether you're suffering or not. Only you can tell you, what, tell you whether you're suffering. That's the problem with someone like Mr. X, because it isn't, you, don't, you don't engage in someone's desire to end their life because they had a bad day. Right? You have to have a long period of, of repeated and consistent desire before anybody except for Jack Kevorkian would... would um, and by the way, that was exactly the problem with Jack Kevorkian. Right? He would show up, talk to someone for an hour, and in some cases even less, and then engage um, in euthanizing activities with them. <coughs> and when he was challenged, well, what if they're just depressed and, and tomorrow they'll be fine? His argument was, I'm a physician, I can tell when someone's depressed. Well, Jack Kevorkian was a pathologist, had never studied psychiatry at all. And the idea that he could tell when someone's depressed was kind of silly, especially given who he was. I'll tell you a quick sideline Jack Kevorkian story. So I was on a committee to look at cord blood, umbilical cord blood, and it's used for, as a stem cell source. So we had this person come in and give us, the, the committee gave us a long lecture on the history of blood and how we think about blood and how blood types were discovered and all of this interesting stuff about blood. And she shows, she shows this picture from 1950, late 1950s um, of this of the first attempts to create transfusions in the battlefield. And so what they tried was this thing where they would put an IV line into a just dead body, right? And, and there's another soldier lying there who needs blood, and they would transfuse directly from that dead body into the soldier. This was attempted, right? So she shows, and there's a picture in this article of someone standing there holding this device with someone pretending to be dead. I mean, this was just the picture in the article. Someone pretending to be dead lying there, and someone pretending to be a living soldier to show you this device. The man standing there holding the device is Jack Kevorkian. <laughs> so, um, so he was into this stuff long before he started it. 
Um, you know, uh, so that so it's a, so it is a big problem. There is a book written, uh, edited by Noam Zohar on Jewish end of life issues. I wrote the chapter called Jewish Views of Quality of Life. So if you're really interested in this, you know, email me and I'll send it to you. Quality of life is an important. I mean. People generally don't want to die who have a great quality of life. So it is almost a given that if someone is expressing a desire to die, it is because in their view their quality of life is really suffering. And what you need is a consistent, um, over time, view of a bad quality of life, one that can't be remediated, right? Um, before I think you even start asking the question about whether it is ethical or not for someone to end their life at that point. It is sometimes, and sometimes it's not. There are people who very consistently express a desire to die over and over again without that mercurial nature to it. But sometimes it's very mercurial. Right? I agree with you. We want to thank Paul so much uh, no. for sharing his thoughts with us. Uh, I want to thank again the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation for supporting this event, and we hope you will join us again soon. Thanks a lot.